Good afternoon, LGL 130 intro to the Canadian legal system for law clerk students at Seneca College. Welcome to week 12. If you'll excuse the background, um, I'm in another room today on account of, uh, well, social isolation and other things. I hope you can see me okay. And uh, I wish you could see it's that there's a nice backdrop of the city um, over my left hand shoulder. But um, anyway, Welcome to the first uh, installment of what I hope to be informative, uh, short lectures within 10 to 15 minutes about uh, the Canadian Constitution. Uh, going forward in the next, uh, in the remaining weeks of the Seneca winter semester, we will be doing this from my YouTube channel. I will post these on Blackboard and uh, of course you will have access to them to uh, watch and listen to as much as you would like. Um, please read chapter six, the um, the chapter on the Canadian Constitution in our textbook, and uh, follow along with the lecture slides which have been posted on Blackboard. So let's go. Again, I want to keep these uh, to about 10, 15 minutes length uh, at the most, um, and you can watch or rewatch them at your leisure. So uh, part one of uh, this week's classes will include a history of the Canadian Constitution. I have on the lecture slides to 1867, but we will go up to uh, more contemporary times, all the way up to 1982. The second part, we'll, we will discuss uh, the Canadian Constitution in depth, uh, just a, uh, maybe not in depth, but a broad survey of sort of what the Constitution actually is. The third part will look at the division or the heads of powers of the Canadian Constitution, specifically what the federal government does and what the uh, provincial government does, or and their respective parliaments, of course. The fourth part will look at amending the Constitution, and the final part will look at uh, what happens when the provincial powers and the federal powers conflict, the interplay that happens between them, and uh, we'll take up the questions uh, your questions are at the back of this lecture uh, slides, the assigned questions. Okay, so let's start. What is the Constitution? Where did it come from? Well, that's why we're, we're looking at the history of the Constitution at this time. The Canadian Constitution is the skeletal framework of our country, the laws, the politics, how it all works. And uh, of course, you know, it is, you know, how it all happens. Um, I know that's not descriptive, but you, let's look at sort of the context of why I'm here today, the COVID-19 uh, global pandemic, which uh, of course is having serious effects on Canada. And uh, basically the constitution is sets out sort of where the powers are. Um, healthcare delivery, is delivered to you uh, by the provincial government. Closing the borders at Canada's airports or um, stopping all flights, closing the airports, those are responsibilities made by the federal government. And uh, so that is all um, divided up, so to speak, in the Canadian constitution. And just as a side note, I, I also want to say that um, I will be doing some smaller lectures about what's happening out in the wider world and the legal ramifications of that. Um, just as soon as I sort of uh, maybe brush off my Canadian, brush up on my Canadian constitutional law uh, and get a little bit better with working uh, this camera. So the constitution, looking at slide four, is a special law that provides the framework of the organization of this country. So let's go to slide five, part one, history of the Canadian Constitution. <clears throat> so we've, uh, we've discussed a lot of these uh, matters already, but I, I'd like to um, just go back to them, just to sort of reiterate some of the, the uh, items we've discussed. And uh, yeah, start with, again, the Royal Proc Proclamation of 1763. Okay, sorry about that. I just had, a, had to answer. A, uh, and, and I might do that, I might just sort of pause the video, so I'm sorry about it if they're a little disjointed, but the Royal Proclamation of 1763. So you'll recall we had a seven years war here in North uh, America and around the world. 
Um, it was primarily fought in North America between the British and the French and their respective Aboriginal allies, which played a very important role in it, but it was fought elsewhere in Europe between the European powers, um, France and uh, the British in India with uh, respective Indian allies and so forth. But the result of the Seven Years' War was a, essentially the handing over of the North American French-speaking colonies from France to the United Kingdom. And this was manifested in two things. The first was the Treaty of Paris of 1763, which ended the war and ended up um, and gave the British a large number of French-speaking peoples uh, along the St. Lawrence River, uh, River in what is presently Quebec, and the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Now, most recently, we've talked about that within the context of Aboriginal law, and what that means even up until this day with um, Aboriginal uh, rights and um, the nation-to-nation -nation relationship between the um, Aboriginal peoples and the federal government, uh, based, of course, in our capital city of Ottawa. But what it did is that the British now, or the, the Treaty of Paris, of course, had uh, the British now had control over large parts of uh, North America. And where we are presently uh, in the city of Toronto, uh, in the province of Ontario, was once at one point uh, part of Quebec. But um, <clears throat> this wouldn't uh, last for long because eventually along the line, or along uh, the historical uh, evolution of North America came the American Revolution. And the 13 colonies uh, in the United States uh, re rebelled and were successful in their re rebellion, becoming a, the American Revolution against the United Kingdom. One of the laws that precipitated the American Revolution was the Quebec Act of 1774. And what this did was that this allowed for the people, the colonists in Quebec, now basically without any ties to France in Europe, uh, allowed for them to maintain their civil law uh, code and civil legal system for um, uh, private law matters. So the common law and various other elements were, uh, the English common law was adapted for public law matters, but private law became elements of the, um, or maintained the civil code. And as we have talked about many times before, Canada is a bi-jural nation, which uh, currently has um, the Quebec civil code uh, in existence in the province of Quebec. But anyway, what happened was after the American Revolution, is that um, many people did not want to join and become part of the U new United States of America, and they wanted to uh, maintain their, their ties to the crown. So um, many, uh, and these people were labeled, uh, were called loyalists um, by the British and Tories by the Americans. They went north up uh, through uh, New York and New England and settled in uh, areas of Quebec which would eventually become the province of Ontario. So settlements uh, like uh, the currently existing the city of Kingston or the, uh, the currently existing city of uh, Belleville, which is located in Loyalist County and so forth. These uh, were the, 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 this was the genesis of English speaking Canada. And uh, so what happened in 1791 is that this area was separated from Quebec and became what is now uh, what was then known as Upper Canada. And this was sort of a very much a colony of England in the wilderness of North America. The um, city of York, which is now Toronto, was, um, <clears throat> was founded uh, later. The original capital of Upper Canada was uh, called Newark, which is now known as Niagara-on-the-Lake, and uh, so forth. So uh, this was the beginning of Upper Canada and English-speaking Canada more generally. And what this did was establish uh, English-based common law in the province of Upper Canada, as well as established a legislative assembly for uh, the Upper Canadians to vote and elect representatives and so forth. 
This would not last long because in 1840, after what were called the uh, rebellions of 1837, one in Upper Canada, another in Lower Canada, where um, there was dissatisf uh, um, dis dissatisfaction with the, the ruling elites in Upper and Lower Canada. Uh, in Upper Canada, where we are now, is called the Family Compact. Basically, there were unsuccessful rebellions. So these rebellions happened. They were not successful in overthrowing um, the monarch or the government of the day. But what happened was, is a, a fellow, a British fellow named Lord Durham, was commissioned to come over here to write the Lord Durham's report. And amongst other things, uh, Lord Durham um, counseled. And you know, there's some reasons for this. I don't really want to go into, but um, but uh, counseled amongst other things uh, the union of the of the provinces into uh, one uh, one one province, and that happened in the Act of Union of 1840, where Upper Canada, where we are now, and Lower Canada, Quebec, were merged into one province called Canada, not the Dominion Canada that we know of today, but um, basically uh, it was Canada West and Canada East, and they had sort of equal representation. The capital moved sometimes. It was actually a little more complex than I want to go into right now, but Basically, we are getting into this idea of unifying the colonies of North America. And so, yes, let's move on to slide seven. <clears throat> so following sort of the British lead and the British Constitution back in the United Kingdom, um, the Union of, uh, of the Province of Canada, you know, kept humming along uh, until, you know, about the... American Civil War, which happened from 1861 to 1865. And it was the American Civil War that really gave the leadership of the colonies, uh, the British colonies, pause. And the reason for that, of course, is that it proved um, quite uh, decisively that the American colonies were an emerging industrial powerhouse. And they had a brutal civil, civil war. Up until that date, I believe the most brutal humanity had ever seen. And uh, it was really something that was, um, you know, very, uh, you know, very bloody, but gave, you know, allowed for the co colonial leaders to say, what happens if the guns of the Americans were that had been turned south were then turned north and expansion into the northern portion of North America occurred. So... Around that time, the maritime provinces of PEI, Nova Scotia, and, uh, and New Brunswick uh, were deciding to, uh, to join, to become one maritime province. And it was very much a sense uh, of crashing the party that Sir John A. Macdonald, from uh, a Kingston-based uh, politician and lawyer, decided to go crash the party and, uh, and see what would happen. And eventually... In 1867, you had uh, passed over in the United Kingdom the British North America Act. And the British North America Act was um, a statute that created a new dominion of Canada with four originating provinces, Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and uh, New Brunswick, PEI, and BC, and uh, Manitoba, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Newfoundland, and Labrador. They would all join a little later. Um, but, uh, yeah, the original four provinces of the Dominion of Canada, which is the state that we are currently in now, um, uh, were those provinces. And their uh, constitutional document was the British North America Act, 1867. If you look at slide eight, I just want to look at sort of the history of the courts and uh, how this is sort of, after 1867, Canada incrementally moved away from the United Kingdom towards the independent state that we are now. Of course, we share to this day a sovereign with uh, the United Kingdom as well as Australia and New Zealand in uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. But again, it's a story of incremental independence. Um, <clears throat> we talked a lot about criminal law in our last lecture where we were together before uh, the, um, the crisis hit and the classes closed down. And we talked about the founding of the Supreme Court of Canada in 1885, how an appellate court was created by the federal parliament for Canada. And uh, that, of course, had a major effect because we had our own appellate court 
Now this, of course, the creation of the, the Supreme Court of Canada did not end appeals to London. The Judicial Committee of the Privy Council was still there and was still appealed to, but there was a court in existence. I talked last week about, or two weeks ago now, about the Criminal Code and how Canada adapted its own Criminal Code in 1892. And it was based on the uh, James Fitzjames Stevens Criminal Code back in the UK, but mixed in with our Minister of Justice and other lawyers, its own Canadian elements and Canadian identity. And this sort of charted us on a separate path for criminal law, which to this day in the United Kingdom, they still have common law offenses. So again, we're moving towards a Canadian legal independence. I uh, want to talk about the Colonial Laws Validity Act of 1865. Now these, uh, this was, I, th I think there was more than one, but these were imperial statutes passed over in the United Kingdom that said, any law in the colonies cannot, uh, cannot conflict with an imperial statute in London or in the United Kingdom, excuse me. So um, th this was sort of an avenue which sort of kept the colonial laws in line with the imperial laws back in the imperial parliament. And this had a couple of ramifications, one of which was it was kind of a, it meant that it, it stopped, for lack of a better word, you know, Canadian constitutional development in many respects. And so I have listed there a case called Naden uh, and the King from 1926. And this was basically a matter which said that, um, that when the federal parliament stopped appeals to the Privy Council with relation to criminal law, that that was an invalid statute. So Canada could not, did not have the powers to stop appeals to the, to the Privy Council. And uh, that all ended in uh, 1932 with what's called the Statute of Westminster. This was again passed after uh, Lord Balfour's report, a report by a noble over in the United Kingdom, which recommended independence, you know, more or less de facto independence for the, the settler colonies, so Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and Canada. And the uh, Statute of Westminster had that effect. It basically said uh, the United Kingdom will not change any of the laws uh, over in the colonies. And if a law is passed in the colony, um, <clears throat> we will not interfere with it. So eventually with that, just a few years later, like one or two years later, you have the Criminal Code Amendment Act where appeals to the Privy Council were ended for criminal matters. And this again, had the effect of, of stopping all appeals to the British Court Judicial Committee of the Privy Council for Criminal Matters. The case British Coal and the King is listed on slide eight, but it's also listed again on slide nine, where I will read from Lord Sankey. In truth, quote, in truth, Canada is in full enjoyment of the full scope of self-government. That is from Lord Sankey from British Coal and the King. 1935, as you can see there. So basically, it was really just a question of time before all appeals would be ended to the Privy Council. And in 1949, that stopped. Um, can't recall exactly when the last appeal to uh, the Privy Council was. I think it was in the, um, in the 50s, sometime in the early 50s. But it was done. Final slide to look at for this short lecture and to uh, we're up at almost 20 minutes, so I went a little bit longer than I thought. But uh, basically, Prime Minister Trudeau, and uh, with this, I am going to read something. Sorry about that, just had to get the book itself. But um, I just wanted to get a book from the former Prime Minister, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, which I have a copy of and have had for a while. But OK, so so. After appeals to the Privy Council had ended for both criminal and um, civil matters, and Canada had fought valiantly in the Second World War, and sort of new developments within the United Nations and the human rights, um, you know, developments, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and things like that, a um, a scholar 
um, a legal scholar named Pierre Elliott Trudeau was um, drafted by Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson. Uh, and you, of course, heard of him from his, uh, his the aptly named the Lester B. Pearson International Airport. But um, Mr. Trudeau was um, became Justice Minister in, for Canada, and uh, he had many legal ideas. One of which was an entrenched Bill of Rights, and um, you know, and bringing the Constitution home, making the Canadian Constitution an instrument that could um, better deal with sort of any uh, animosities that were happening between the English-speaking Canadians and the French-speaking Canadians in Quebec. Um, as you know, or may not know, but uh, at, uh, after the war, there was something called the Quiet Revolution happened, and this was basically um, a nationalist, uh, independent thinking um, uh, revolution that uh, that many people in Quebec were thinking about becoming a sovereign state. So um, uh, Mr. Trudeau uh, saw this and uh, wanted to use the uh, the Constitution as sort of an instrument to to mitigate this at the very least. So I will read to you from Maclean's February 8th, 1964. So before Mr. Trudeau was in uh, politics, active politics, but uh, it, it's titled, We Need a Bill of Rights. Here it is, quote, the only important instance where the third stage appears to have been reached by the Canadians seems to be precisely in the area of a Bill of Rights. Since 1946, four provinces and a central government have given themselves statutory bills of rights. Numerous parliamentary committees have inquired into the matter. Many public bodies, including the Canadian Bar, have reported on the subject. Much writing has been published by historians and other concerned persons. And what is more important in the present context, a constitutionally entrenched Bill of Rights seems to be the best tool for breaking the ever reoccurring deadlock between Quebec and the rest of Canada. If certain language and educational rights were written into the Constitution, along with other basic liberties, in such a way that no government, federal or provincial, could legislate against them, French Canadians would cease to feel confined to their Quebec ghetto, and the spirit of separatism would be laid forever. Close quote. So that is from Maclean's Magazine, February 8, 1964. Okay, so there we go. Lecture number one finished. Tomorrow I will do lecture uh, number two, and it will be on, uh, you know, what is the Canadian Constitution? I've sort of set the tone. We're going to have a constitution that looks British. We're going to have a constitution because, you know, Mr. Trudeau is in many respects was the driving force for this. So we're going to talk a little bit about the constitution within um, an entrenched framework. We're going to, uh, you know, it being entrenched uh, is basically very difficult to change. We're going to talk about a Bill of Rights, although we have mostly already talked about the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but we'll, d we'll discuss that a little bit. And uh, we'll we'll look at sort of it, you know it being both federal, a little bit British, and uh, and entrenched. So thank you for helping me with uh, part one of our online lecture. And we're at 23 minutes, so we'll stop there. Thank you again for your patience, um, and uh, just stay socially isolated. Um, make make those calls, make those emails. I don't know about you, but a lot of people are talking online, which has been great for me. But please uh, stay healthy and safe, and I'll stop, uh, speak with you tomorrow. Thank you.